And of course, I am very grateful to the organizer for inviting me, especially because I am a neuroscientist. I am, my field is uh, neurophysiology, and autism is a kind of side uh, branch of my research. So my talk will be essentially about mirror neurons, and then you will see why they have invited me. Maybe some relation there is between a mirror mechanism and autism. Well, as, as some years ago, as probably many of you know, we discovered a specific set of neurons which fire both when the monkey perform an action and when the monkey observe a similar action made by another individual. We call it this neuron mirror neurons. Uh, later on, we and other people discovered this type of neurons in many species, in several species, and in many areas. So we know now that mirror neurons are present in birds, are present in monkeys, are present in humans, and in the primates they are present in several areas, so in different parietal and frontal areas, as well as in emotional centers like insula and anterior cingulate. So that's changed radically our view of mirror neurons. Originally, we spoke about a mirror system, and that also was a point of discussion, say how a mirror system can make, can be, can, under, can underline so many different functions. So now, I think the correct version is to say that the mirror mechanism, the mirror, it's a mechanism. It's a basic mechanism, very similar to other basic mechanisms, like uh, maybe it's an exaggeration. If you think about uh, EPSP, excitatory potentials, uh, postsynaptic potential, uh, if they are in the muscle, they produce contraction. If they are in the visual system, they produce vision, and so on. The same is true for the mirror mechanism. So it has no unique function, but the function depends on where is anatomically located. This is an example of mirror neurons. You see it's uh, in A, a person grasping, and in B, it's the monkey grasping. I will show you in a moment a movie which will, ex ex will explain better the phenomenon. But that's what I was saying just a second ago. A second. The mirror mechanism is a basic mechanism that transforms sensory representation into a motor format. That's the trick the transformation of sensory information into a motor format. You will see the consequence of it. It is located in a multiplicity of cortical areas and neural centers, and it has different functions according to the anatomical location. Well, said so, uh, where we start, uh, where we discovered them, I want to start from the very beginning. We started from area F5, which is a premotor cortex in the monkey, and at the beginning, we were not interested at all in mirror neurons. We were interested to describe the property of this area. And we found that some of those neurons were motor neurons, no surprise. But then there were two categories of visual neurons. One, we call them canonical neurons, and the other, mirror neurons. But also the motor neurons have some particular type of properties. You know from classical neurology that left hand is controlled by the right hemisphere, the right hand from the left hemisphere. So one expected that also at the neural level it should be a correlation between sight and localization in the brain. But what we found that most neurons in premotor cortex respond not to the movement, but respond to the goal of the action. So you see here, it's a monkey grasping an object, and the discharge is present when the monkey is grasping with the right hand, with the left hand, and even with the mouth. So there is no strict rule of contralaterality, and in addition, if the goal is achieved using another effector like mouth, it's still present in the discharge. So primary motor cortex is indeed organized mostly, not exclusively in terms of classical neurology, but the premotor cortex have two different things. First, it's not strictly contralateral. Second, it codes the goal, not the movement. What's the difference? I will come back on this point several times. So let's imagine that you have a TMS experiment. You stimulate here, and you see some movement of the hand here. That's movement. But what we call motor act, it's movement with a goal. And that's what characterizes the cortex in primates. Movement is only a part of it. Then movement is, of course, uh, carried out by subcortical centers. Well, when we propose it, that what it's called, it's movement, 
It was accepted, but with some doubt. They say, well, maybe there are some synergy rather than real motor art. So this is a more recent experiment in which we trained monkey to use this instrument. And uh, if you look at them, the second um, back, this, the normal pliers are logical pliers. You close your hand and you grasp the object. But the other are crazy because you open your hand and then you grasp the object. So you have opposite movements in order to achieve the same goal. That was a kind of challenge to us. If it's true that motor act are called not movement, you must have the neurons fire in both cases. And now if se potete cliccare, now what you will see, I need sound, of course. Okay, that's a grasping neuron. You see the monkeys grasping this object, and every time there is a discharge. Now it's using the instrument, the crazy instrument. The discharge is there. Now look now. The monkey is moving nervously, this instrument, but there is no discharge. Movement is there, but there is no goal. Of course, we did the more formal experiment, we place it a potentiometer between the handle of the instrument. And when you see the, I don't think I can point you, but anyway, when you see the curve going down, it means that the hand is closing. And you see the discharge is present on the left side with normal pliers when the hand is closing, but on the other part, it's when the hand is opening. And here is even better example. So what it means, that's extremely interesting because we have only a couple of synapses away from the spinal cord. And yet, we have a plasticity. So the monkey, when changes from one instrument to the other, it's able to grasp using a completely different set of movement. So our interpretation is what really we are born with the capacity to code goal. And then according to contingency in which the person is living, it became grasping, it means closing, or grasping means opening, and so on. So, which is very nice also for some pathology. So if you are born with some deficit, you can learn the same because the goal is inside your motor system. Well, now uh, I have no time to speak about the other category of neurons, which we call it canonical neurons. They, they practically transform the affordance of objects into grasp. But let's see the mirror neurons, which will be more important. So now you will see again grasping neuron, and you will recognize immediately one will be also a mirror neuron. So please, next one. Okay. That's again a grasping neuron, similar to the one you saw already. And un altro così. Come prima, tiring. Ancora. That's the mirror effect. It's the same neuron. It's a dialogue. One or the other. Well, you see, it's very easy to recognize mirror neurons. If you are in the place in the brain where are, you, you can find many, many of them, and you don't need statistics, you don't need histograms, you just see them. Um, and also notice that they are highly repetitive. So every time when Fogassi, who is the actor, was doing the action, there was a discharge. Uh, one point which is of some importance is generalization. You notice that it was a discharge both when the Fogassi grasped it with the hand and with the mouth. And that's a very important concept because generalization is really the way when we understand the thing. Without generalization, the knowledge is very shallow, superficial. Well, 
nothing to do with conditioning. These neurons are there. I don't know if they are genetically determined or they are developed at the beginning of uh, the life. Anyway, in our case, there was no conditioning. The monkey A, its intruder, has nothing to do with experiment, and this monkey was eating food. Every time this monkey was grasping and eating, and so she was reinforced, there was a discharge in the brain of the first monkey. So it's nothing to do with reinforcement. What is the function of mirror neurons? From the very beginning, we have this doubt. Imitation or actual understanding? So imitation seems to be the easiest explanation. Everything thinks that apes ape, uh, the apes ape, and in Italy the same, the scimmie scimmiottano. But as a matter of fact, uh, this type of monkey, macaque monkey, are not good imitators. They have some grimaces, they respond to you, but they are not good imitators. So I think imitation is something of higher order, which is typical of our species, and develop it later. So the basic mechanism, I think on the top of this mechanism, imitation, uh, then develop it, but is action, understanding. Well, how to demonstrate it? One possibility was, let's imagine, so if this neuron it's important for understanding. It doesn't matter if what I present is in one modality, in another modality, or even in kind of mental imagery of the fact. So we decided not to do what usually physiology do, so destroy a large part of the brain to demonstrate that mirror neurons do something, but rather to change the contingencies. So in this case, we try it with auditory stimuli. An example which I like to do is imagine that you are in your room, somebody is walking, and you recognize that somebody walking. You don't see it, but you recognize the action. So we use it with Christian Kaiser, Vittorio Galesi, and others, uh, different sound which characterize actions. And so that's it's our protocol. That has not been published, but it's easier to understand. You see here a series of trials. And in this case, the experiment tears a sheet of paper into pieces and sees what, what's going on. Monkey sees what's going on, and there is a discharge, this uh, increase of dots that you see of small lines. Well, here, the monkey cannot see. There is only the sound. So, and still, the neuron fires. It means that these neurons say, it's grasping, or it's breaking a piece of paper, or it's breaking a sheet, a tear, a sheet of paper. Here it's a control, it's white noise, nothing happens, and that's it's curious because we presented also chimpanzee calls. Chimpanzee are the big enemies of the monkeys, and so the monkey was scared, and the increase of arousal determined a decrease also of spontaneous activity, and yet there was no response. This paper appeared in Science, and they asked us, of course, to do a lot of statistics, and the results are here show exactly the same thing in a more complicated way. So you see here in S, it's sound. Blue is the line which indicates the preferred stimulus. And in red, the stimulus which is not preferred is much less active. Well, uh, one can say, why we need the motor system in order to understand action? Here is a sentence from Marc Jadero, with whom I collaborated for many years. And he wrote in 204, a mere visual perception without involvement of the motor system would only provide a description of the visible aspect of the movement, but it would not give precise information about the intrinsic component of the observed action, which are critical for understanding what the action is about, what is its goal, and how to reproduce it. That's also important, because I think this mechanism is very important to reproduce, although it needs additional things, it's not the mirror system per se, but other things which help mirror system, so also for imitation is important. Well, that's on the left side are the three guys which were with me when we discovered mirror neurons. They are now well-known people, Luciano Fadiga, Leonardo Fogassi, Vittorio Galese. On the right side are the youngest group 